You guys ready for some word today? Ready for some, ready for some truth in a world where it's hard to find some truth? Let's, let's dig into God's word. So I was, um, I was heading west on I-10 out of New Mexico, heading back into Arizona after visiting my parents. And uh, there's that little checkpoint. There's that little border patrol checkpoint. And as I was waiting in line, you know, creeping closer to the front, right, it dawned on me that this was the first time that I had taken my wife's new car, by new car, I mean a 2016 Ford Explorer, new to us. We bought it used. So we were, it was the first time I'd ever taken that through that checkpoint. And I thought about where I bought the car. I bought it in downtown Phoenix at a really kind of shady place. <laughs> it was a, a salvage title. And, and the guy who sold me the car walks out and he's got a nine millimeter, or it looked like a nine millimeter Glock, out of, hanging out of his back. Not even a holster. I mean, just old school, like right down there. So I'm thinking to myself, as I'm getting closer to the Boulder, Border Patrol agent, what if this was a drug car? And they left some contraband, like, hidden in a secret compartment. And so I'm thinking about this, and my palms start to sweat. And I get closer to the, to the agent, and just as I roll down my window and to see if I can get through, I hear the dog bark. I'm not joking. You can ask my family. The dog, bark, 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 bark. My heart starts racing. Oh, dear God, this is going to be bad for the church. <laughs> and, and I see the dog, and he goes right next to us, there was a white truck, and he must have hit on something. The border patrol waves us through. I'm like, Whew. So I told my family, I said, what was going on and how I was worried, and I thought we were, might be in big trouble. And then my daughter, Stella, from the back seat says, would, would we all have gotten arrested? My wife says, no, just your father. <laughs> true story. I wish it wasn't true, but it was true. But why was I nervous going through there? Why? Because in that situation, the Border Patrol agent had authority over me. To have authority over someone is to have power over someone. We're in week two of our tethered series where we're looking at how to develop this anchored faith, a faith that is strong and stable. And we talked last week how we have anchor points. And sometimes we anchor to the wrong thing. We tether to the wrong thing. Instead of anchoring to Christ, tethering to the cross, to Jesus, to the truth, we anchor ourselves to maybe a, a substance, maybe a, a possession, material goods. Maybe a, it's a person. Maybe it's a career. Maybe we anchor ourselves to fear. Or maybe we anchor ourselves to a lie that someone spoke over us and we begin to believe it. We're anchored to something. What the, the problem with that is, is that we begin to have an a, attachment to a false, a, a false authority right? A false authority. And that authority that we're tethered to, whatever it or that person is, it begins to have power, have dominion over us. Instead of living the life that Christ has for us, we live compromised lives because we're governed by a false authority. My question for us today, myself included, and I was very convicted as I was studying for this, who or what has authority over your life. I mean, let's just be real today. We're, we, we, we came to church to hear truth and to be changed. Who or what has authority over your life, over your thoughts, over your actions, over your values, over your time? Is it Jesus or is it something or someone else? Are you anchored to something or someone other than Christ? Because the answer to that question will determine the stability of of your faith, whether you are tethered or severed. Let's get into God's word. Daniel chapter three. We're gonna look at three Hebrew boys who uh, show us how to put our authority or help us to allow Jesus to have authority over us, to be Lord of our life. Daniel chapter three, if you've got your Bibles, if not, it'll be on the screen behind us. The Israelites were living in Babylonian exile. The king there was King Nebuchadnezzar. He was a real winner. Very, very humble guy. He was so prideful that he had a statue built 90 feet, 90 feet tall, 
nine feet wide, laced in gold that represented himself, okay? He, he invited everyone from all over the region, leaders, dignitaries, generals, governors, thousands of people, all to come and worship him. He wanted them to worship and bow down when they heard the music. And if you didn't bow down when you heard the music, there's a pit over there. They dug a big pit, and there's what we call the fiery furnace. And you would be thrown in the furnace if you didn't bow down. Any wiggle room in there? Nope, no wiggle room. So these three Jewish boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were observed by some astrologers. Oh, they didn't bow down. He goes and narks them out, goes to the king. They didn't bow down, king. So the king is furious. Daniel chapter 3, verse 13. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And by the way, they, they worked uh, as king's officials, so the king obviously knew them. Is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? He said, again, one more chance, right? Satan always gives you one more chance to sell out. Verse 15, now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Even God can't sink this ship. How'd that work out? Listen to the fortitude. Listen, listen to the response. I love this. This is, one of, this is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Woo! Put that in your pipe and smoke it, Nebby. Put that in your nebulizer. Ooh! I didn't even... Should have thought of that ahead. That was a good one. <laughs> Lord, shut me up so you can speak. In all seriousness, Lord, you have a good word. And I don't want to mess it up. Thank you, God, for the truth of your word that changes our lives. We need to hear it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's point number one. Authority determines priority. The authority that you and I have in our life will dictate what we do. It'll dictate our actions. It'll dictate our, our thoughts. Authority determines priority, which is why they could say minutes away from death. I mean, right? I mean, they have a heart. They have fear. They have emotions, right? They have sweaty palms. The, the, they're looking at the one person, the one human being that can change their situation, that can save their life. And yet they respond, eh, we don't need to defend ourselves before you. Whoo! Wow. How could they say that? Answer, they already decided which king they were going to let down. Which king are you and I going to let down? Because they didn't want to let down Jesus. First commandment, put no other gods before me. We're not going to do that. We're not going to sell our God out. And God's up there in heaven going, yes, I got three guys that, that trust me. Whether I deliver them in the way they think or not, or the way they hope, they're not going to sell out. Here's what I'm saying. We need to pre-make decisions in life. They didn't wait till they got to there, right? They didn't wait and, and they're like, uh, hey, Shad, what should we do? I don't know, Meshach. What do you think of Bednego? Some awesome names. Do not name, you, no, do, yeah, okay, we're good. Abednego, but like they didn't wait till they were there in front of the king. They had pre-made that decision. We need to pre-make decisions. If you've been married, men, you know you need to pre-make some decisions. When your wife asks you if her haircut is a good haircut, right? I'm not even joking. I made that mistake, a similar mistake, just a few weeks ago. My, my wife bought these, mom, they're called mom jeans. You know this? <laughs> they're called mom jeans. You get, I'm, I'm not joking. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. All right, so they're mom jeans, and they're like, you know, 
kind of, you know, baggy or whatever. I guess maybe that's, I don't know, maybe that's why they call them mom jeans. I don't know. But, and she said, hey, sweetheart, do you like my mom jeans? And, and, be, and before, you know, I should have pre-made the decision, right? But before I thought, I, I spoke. And I said, oh, they kind of make you look frumpy. It was like, the, the, yeah, the, the, the word left my tongue. I was like, frumpy. I wanted to take it back. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Dear God, what have I done? So later on that, that night, I was like, hey, what's, what's, what's for dinner, sweetheart? She's like, you're on your own. You're, <laughs> your frumpy wife is taking the week off, she said. <laughs> oh, man. We got to, we got to, we got to make some decisions, y'all. But seriously, like when it comes to like what movies we're going to watch and bring into our home, what apps we're going to have on our phone, what apps we're going to delete, who we're going to vote for, that should be pre-made. Oh, but I really like that, the charismatic nature of this person. I really like his smile. Or he, well, wait a second. What, does he uphold the values here? Sanctity of life? Well, let's start there. Right? We pre-make those decisions. One of the decisions that we make is, is we don't use the word divorce. Now, that doesn't mean we don't fight, right? It doesn't mean we don't argue. It doesn't mean we have our own challenges. We don't fight a lot, okay? But we have, our, we have our arguments, but we don't use that word. We don't use that word. Why? Because if it's not an option, it's not an option. Pre makes some decisions. And, and then I love how they said, we don't have to defend you. In other words, our, the defense rests. The, the, the defense could rest because their defender never rests, yes. right? Psalm 121.4, God never slumbers or never sleeps. They had confidence in him. However he was going to work it out, one way or another, he was going to work it out. And I love, I love 1 Peter 2.23. He, Jesus, did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. Listen to this. He left his case in the hands of God. That's for somebody today. I don't know who it is. You don't have to raise your hand. It's okay if you do. <laughs> but listen, leave your case in the hands of God and your shoulders will be lighter. You'll be able to breathe deeper. You'll be able to smile bigger. Just leave the case in the hands of God. The problem is we want to defend ourselves. You know, we've been watching too much Law and & Order and CSI and Judge Judy. We're thinking we're some sort of defense attorney, right? I, I want to defend myself. We litigate, we adjudicate, we arbitrate, and any other eight word I can think of. And God's like, are you done eating yet? I mean, are you done like uh, trying to defend yourself? Because I can do a much better job. But I want them to understand me. God says, well, they didn't understand me. I mean, if you read the word, he, they called him a drunkard, a glutton. They say, a friend of sinners, they mocked him, they called him phony, they spit in his face, they struck him with his fist. But we want everyone to understand us and like us. Doesn't work that way, y'all. You know, this is, a, this is good news only to those who want to hear it. A lot of people don't want to hear the good news. It's still truth, it's still good news, but it's not good news to them. It wasn't good news to the people who, who killed Jesus, right? Who put him on the cross. And the truth is, he allowed himself to be on the cross. He could have stopped that any time, right? He willingly went. You know what's more important than your feelings? And listen, I'm not trying to be mean or, you know, if you're visiting for the first time, what a jerk. <laughs> listen, I, I'm, I have a heart for you and, and, and I have a heart for people. And, and so I want you to hear the truth. There's something that's more important than your feelings. You know what it is? Your witness. Your witness. God has plans for us to be witnesses. And sometimes when we have... Sometimes when our feelings get in the way, it ruins our witness. Listen, Mark 13, verse 9, Jesus said, On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they stood in front of thousands and were a witness. And we think that that's just for them. Like God would never call you, Tori, to be a witness. No, he's called you to be a witness at the plant where you work, right? He's called you to be a witness wherever we go, wherever we're at. At Cox Cable, he's called you to be a witness. Mike? Right? We're, ever, we're called to be witnesses, but we can't be a good witness if we're butthurt. So many people in the church, I know you're laughing, Josh, but how many people in the church do you personally know that have gotten butthurt over some silly little thing? 
right? We get all upset and, and, and we want to defend ourselves. And God says, you know what? You can't be faithful if you're fragile. You can't be faithful if you're fragile. If we're always getting butthurt, always getting up offended, always, you know, taking stuff the wrong way. Well, what did he mean by that? <laughs> Stop worrying about people liking you and understanding you and agreeing and relating. I love what C.S. Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity. He said, you will never make a good impression on other people until you stop thinking about what sort of impression you're making. I want to illustrate. Uh, bring that out, guys. Um, come, on, come on out here. I want to I do something that's, that's going to be very freeing for someone. So here we go. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. So this is these rocks, these, this pea gravel, this represents the, the stones that people throw at you, right? Those, those accusations, those hurtful words, that accusatory tongue, the innuendos, all the disparaging words that people spew. Would you say that's heavy? It's heavy, right? It's only heavy if you pick it up. <laughs> it's not heavy to me. Man, I used to get so butthurt when I first started this church. I was like a little wimpy pastor, always worrying about someone offending, you know, this and that. And that. I would chase them down. You know what God said? Help those people who, who want help. And so I don't chase anymore. I love you. And, and, and I'm here for you. And I care about you. I pray for you. But I'm not going to chase after you. Because I need to help the people who want helped. Right? And, and so God had to teach me that. And I hope you can learn from, from, from my mistakes. It's only heavy if you pick it up. Because once you pick that up, it has authority over you. Right? Now it has authority into your life, over your life, and it has power over you. But it doesn't if you do the moonwalk, you know what I'm saying? I didn't even practice that, LaMonica. All right. There's more where that came from. And there's, I want to I read that verse one more time because there's a little nugget in there that I think you might have missed. Verse 16 again. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him. Wait a second. Do you really think they all formulated that answer ahead of time and said, okay, on the count of three, ready guys? One, two, three, all together. King Nebuchadnezzar, hurry up. We do not need to defend ourselves. No, I don't think that's the way it happened. I think they had a speaking cap. I think one person said it, but they were united, right? Their priorities were congruent. What am I saying? I'm saying there's power in numbers. When we, uh, he's our first authority, right? He will never let us down. People let us down. I let people down, right? None of us are perfect. But second to our secondary authorities are anchor points called the church, called people who are striving vertically for Jesus. So we make these horizontal connections, right? Where we anchor to each other, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They anchored together and so that they could you know, have this uh, unity and this strength. Here's what I'm saying. I want to encourage you to develop, and this is the original term, but I'll explain it to you. Develop faith redundancy. Faith redundancy. What do I mean? Well, in engineering, redundancy is the duplication of critical components or functions of a system with the intention of increasing reliability of the system. In other words, multiple points of failure so that it doesn't ultimately fail. I want to illustrate this. Work with me. My mind works in weird ways. So we're going to lower this down. So I, Michelle, our lovely assistant from Dysart, is going to lower this down. She's going to, I think she needs a drum. You need a drum roll, Michelle? You want me to beg? All right, thank you. No, she's awesome. Uh, so, th so this is our LED wall. Every setup in Teardown Church has an LED wall, right? No. It's like we have like five, I don't know how many trailers we got now. It's crazy. But we want, we want to uh, do the, and by the way, if you're not serving, I don't know if you know this, 
We have to tear that down piece by piece each and every week. The lobby, you know, the kids, you know, this all is set up and torn down every week. So if you're sitting on your blessed assurance, <laughs> get off your blessed assurance and on the way out, sign up to serve on a set up tear down team or one of the other ministries. Okay. We need you. We need you. There's a family. Families roll up our sleeves. We get our hands dirty. Okay. But let me ex illustrate this. So you see those purple sl slings? Here's one right here. Now, the whole, by the way, the whole wall weighs 900 pounds. This is rated at 2,000 pounds, okay? Now, you notice there's uh, nine of them, right? So nine at 2,000 pounds a piece, that's 18,000 pounds. Plus, we actually have uh, an additional wired uh, sling on each well, one there. You can kind of see it in one there. They're each another 2,000. So you're looking at... Uh, 22,000, right? So 18 plus 4 is 22. So 22,000 pound capacity for a 900 pound wall. Now, why would we do that? Because if one fails, the others will hold it up. I wonder, do we have anybody in our life that if we fail, if we're about to go off the cliff, would hold us up? That's called faith redundancy. Does you have, do you have redundancy for your faith? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. And who knows? Abednego might have got squirrely. I think we should take a knee. Meshach, no, 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 no. We ain't going to sell out, right? They had strength. They had power in numbers. That's what I love uh, Larissa. Uh, Larissa, she's meeting with the, the ladies on the, on the worship, the young ladies on the worship team. You know about this, Monica? She just started uh, two weeks ago. I meant to tell you. <laughs> See, fa families are messy, you know what I'm saying? Like, but I'm telling you, um, she's meeting with my daughter and some of the other, other young, and being a mentor into their life. See, that's an anchor point, And that's faith redundancy. Other people speaking into other people. Right? That's so important. Uh, Ecclesi or, I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes 4.12, Solomon said, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Do you have some other strands in your life? If you don't, I want to encourage you to get plugged in, man. Get, get plugged into a family circle. Stop on the way out. Sign up for a family circle. S sign up for the women's Bible study. They're rocking and rolling. They started this, uh, this morning, but you can jump in next week. Sign up afterwards. The dude retreat. That's another anchor point. That's another way to, to meet people who are striving to be Christ-like, guys, and, uh, and serve. Just serve in general. There's so many areas you can serve. That's how we connect together. That's how we grow strong. That's how we hold each other up. Authority determines priority. Verse 21. So these men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace, the king's command was so urgent that the fur and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because earlier in the story, he was so mad. He said, heat it up seven times hotter, which is really dumb because if you want to torture someone, you want them to die slowly. You want it to be not as hot. I mean, I'm just saying, I think of these things, okay? Pray for your pastor. Verse 23, and... And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace, right? It was, it was dug out of ground. So they fell into the furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, uh, weren't there three that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Woo! Woo, yeah. Mufasa. Mufasa ain't got nothing on Jesus. So they think, some, some theologians think that might be a Christophany, that it wasn't an actual angel, but it was actually uh, an appearance of the pre-incarnate Christ. There's, that happened several times throughout the Old Testament. So whether... Interesting, but whether that was Jesus uh, in the pre-incarnate Christ or whether that was an angel, either way, there is a fourth in the fire. My question is, where did the angel show up? 
on the perch overlooking the pit or in the pit? In the pit. Which brings us to point number two. The provision is in the pit. If you're watching online, type that in. Somebody needs to hear that. The provision is in the pit. Now, we don't want it to be in the pit. We want to get out the pit. But the provision oftentimes is in the pit. Why wait, God? Why wait? Why wait, um, you know, till we're in the pit? Why, why uh, wait till we're broke or we're sick or we feel defeated or we feel like our, our relationship is hopeless? Why wait till we're in the pit? Because sometimes there's certain things that we can only learn in the pit, Right? We're, there's not as many distractions in the pit. God's got our attention in the pit. But the good news is, the place of testing is also the place of blessing. Right? That provision came in the, in the place of testing. Now, we don't want to go through tests. We don't like it. We run from it. But the truth is, the, t- the blessing coincided with the testing of the pit. It's like this. It's like a, um, it's like the pit is kind of like a car seat. All right. I know. Don't say it. Stephanie was kind enough to allow me to use Chachi's car seat. (laughs) Oh, That's, that's a good one. I got, I, got to, I got to be real. Michael gave me that one. <laughs> Michael told me that before I came out, and I thought, I, I got to use that. <laughs> I, I can't, that's so funny. I can't even, I can't even, I lost my illustration. No. But the pit is much like a car seat. You know, we, we, in a car seat, you, you feel like you're tethered, right? I mean, I, mean, look, I mean, look at all this stuff. It's like, this is, I mean, honestly... If Earnhardt Sr. had this, he'd still be with us. I mean, seriously, this is like crazy. I mean, all that, it's like a NASCAR approved. But we feel tethered, right? We feel like we we can't move in the pit. We feel like God's got us in a spiritual splint. Can't move. And, and, And it's miserable. You know, then you drop your binky. And you can't, I can't, can't reach it. With the first kid, we boiled it every time the, Second kid, no. Third kid, you could drop into rat poison. It was like, <laughs> but we feel like we feel like we're Im- immobilized, right? And you, and the thing about the, the 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 pit, the car seat, it's always messy. It's like you never see a clean car seat. It's it's soiled. It's ruined after the first Happy Meal. <laughs> and then you always find stuff underneath. Isn't that funny? You you take out the car seat. You're like, I wonder how long the fries have been there. They're rock hard. You know, I was wondering where that toy went. But here's the thing about the car seat metaphor here. Here's the thing, is that that's where the child, to some degree, can learn patience, endurance, and the release of control. We look back on the car seat called the pit, and we realize that what hindered us helped us. What restrained us, trained us. See, what if God's restraining is really his training? What if he's got us right where he wants to accomplish the work he needs to? I love what uh, Warren Wiersbe said. He said, the devil tempts us to destroy us. I'm sorry, the devil tempts us to destroy our faith, but God tests us to develop our faith. Isn't that true? He wants to develop our faith. But I want to be honest, and I would be remiss if I didn't point out the totality of this this passage. Because we all want verse 17, right? We all want the provision of verse 17. If, If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Woohoo! I love Christianity. I love you, Jesus. I love verse 17. Hang on. But even if he does not, air just came out of that balloon. We want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. 
I want some verse 18 faith. I mean, it's easy to have 17 faith. But man, I'm working on the verse 18 faith. My mom used to read this story to me before I went to bed. She always said, Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go. Right? She always, it was funny like the first time, but like, you know, it got old really fast. But she, she would always say, if you don't bow, you don't burn, Johnny. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. But that's only part of the story. You know what I'm saying? You don't bow, you don't burn, Johnny. Well, that's not necessarily true. It's not necessarily, it wasn't true for uh, William Tyndale, who in 1536 was burned at the stake for translating the Bible into English. I don't know if you knew this, but up until that point, for the most part, the Bible was only available in Latin because the Catholic Church didn't want the people to be able to read the Bible for themselves. They wanted you to have to go to church. And so the Catholic Church had him labeled a heretic for translating the Bible and producing Bibles, and he was burned at the stake. Well, he didn't bow. Why'd he burn? Why didn't you deliver him, God? I did, son. <laughs> Into my arms. Where there's no sickness. There's no death. There's no cancer. Planes don't fly into buildings. <laughs> there's no place William Tyndale would rather be than with Jesus. Friends, we don't get to pick our delivery method. Right? We, we don't get, it's like, I'm going to choose FedEx, you know what I'm saying? Like, or UPS. No, we, we don't get to do that. God decides that. I know we all want a, a, a Moses miracle of Exodus 14, but sometimes we get a Stephen stoning of Acts 7. But either way, they didn't bow. Either way, they didn't bow. And I'm so proud of Nathan, who's up here. Uh, Nathan Orner, who's right in the middle. He, uh, his sister died when, when, he was, uh, uh, when she was 32 from breast cancer. And over tears, at lunch the other day, he was telling me that story. And, and it broke my heart. But Nathan, I don't know where you're at, but man, I'm, I'm proud of you for your per perseverance, for enduring through that. Because it takes a whole lot more to endure than escape. A lot of people, they run from God. Something bad happens and they run from God. I'm out of here. But you endured. And your family will forever be impacted by your faithfulness, Nathan. I love what Paul Carville said. He said, faithfulness lives where love is stronger than instinct. Our instinct says, if you're in a pit, book it. But the love for Jesus, who is Lord over our life, if he really is the authority, we say, I'll stay right here. And even if you don't take me out of the pit, even if you don't deliver me, even if you don't fix my problem, I'm not going to bow. I want that kind of faith. Let's, let's develop even if faith. Even if faith. What does that mean? Even if 2021 is a year of struggle, I'm not going to bow. Even if my marriage isn't fixed overnight, I ain't going to bow. Even if I don't see the healing that I prayed for, I'm not going to bow. Even if my bank account is empty and I still got an electric bill to pay, I ain't going to bow. Even if there's days where I feel depressed and overwhelmed and I don't want to get out of bed, I'm not going to bow. Even if I have a family member who attacks me with toxic words of hurt and hate, I'm not going to bow. Even if my life hasn't gone the way I planned, because you're the Lord of my life and because you have the authority, you have the final say, I will not bow. And listen to this. Let me close with this. The result of even if faith. Here's the result of even if faith. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted him and defied the king's command, that is the king's authority, and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save this way. Wow. That's the result of three little Jewish boys, young men, who decided we're going to follow God. We're not going to sell out. He's going to be the authority. I, I just wonder, in the midst of all the stuff going on in our nation, 
if God isn't asking us to do the same thing, to stand before people at work, people at school, people at the gym, wherever you go, whoever you see, to stand before and be a witness for Christ like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it might not cost you your life, but it might cost you something. What if we did that? Because God preserved a nation through them. Perhaps God's going to preserve this nation, this great nation, through his people at the gathering and other Christians around the world as we come together under the authority and lordship of Jesus Christ and say, I will not bow. So I'll ask you one more time. Who or what has authority over you? I ask that for myself. Do we live under the authority of the earthly king or do we live under the authority of a king who bears nail-scarred hands? What's it going to be? I pray that we serve an audience of one. We live for the applause of nail-scarred hands. And in doing so, we're free. Who has authority over your life? The answer to that question will determine the strength of your faith, whether you are tethered or whether you're severed. Let's pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Those of you in this room who don't know Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity before we, we go. Those watching online, it's no accident that you just happened to click on this, this feed. Jesus ordained this moment before the foundations of the world because he loved you that much. It wasn't coincidence that you're watching. It's not coincidence for the people who are here. You don't know Jesus and you want to know him. You can know him by simply praying this prayer. That Jesus, I need you in my life. Forgive me for my mistakes. Thank you for seeing me for who I am, the person you've created. I give you my life from this moment forward. I exist to glorify you, Jesus. I am now your child. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family. Let's welcome people to the family of God. Come on. Those of you online, welcome to the family of God. We are celebrating here on your behalf. And if you made that decision, do me a favor, stop at our connect table. We have a gift for you. If you made that decision online, write it in the chat. I made that decision. Also reach out to us at connect at gatheringchurch.org. We want to get, we want to journey with you. If you need prayer today, and I know there's a lot of folks who need prayer, do not leave up out of this church before you come forward and, and, and pray. We are a family. We pray for each other. We love each other through messy times, okay? For the rest of us, be encouraged, be uplifted. God is in control and he is on his throne. Let's Make him the authority in our life this week. Every decision, every action, we run through him. He gets the final say. God bless you. We'll see you back next week.